Y'all better uh, it's time to listen to me babble another. Gather around, everybody. It's time to listen to me babble about another film franchise. This time dealing with the vigilante, and it's not Batman. Oh, well, you should know that it's not Batman by now. Well, I could trick you, but anyways. This vigilante film franchise, I have become fond of it in the last 10 years. Yes, I like Dirty Harry. It's really Dirty Harry. Visual anti. Uh, in a type of way. More of a renegade cop. But anyways, this franchise name, it didn't have all the glitz and glamour, all the theme park rides and 1800 spinoffs and people trying to ruin it with their stupid mad politics agenda going on. No. It's a gritty franchise called Death Wish. With this lead role played by Charles Bronson. This franchise turned up five movies in the span of 20 years. I don't know if the many... Nah, that's rude. I ain't gonna call y'all that if y'all listening. But I don't know if the younger generation knows about the adventure like these films like Death Wish. But you're gonna find out today. You're gonna learn today. So gather around once again, young whippersnappers. Sit back and enjoy the history of the Death Wish franchise. The Death Wish franchise origins did not start in Hollywood, but it started with the author named Brian Garfield, who published a book of the same name in 1972. In the novel, the main character, Paul Benjamin, is an accountant in New York City. His wife and his daughter are attacked by a bunch of heathens, thus taking matters into his own hands with a gun. Garfield was inspired to use the theme of vigilantism on his own encounters with crime. His wife had her purse snatched from her cold fingers, but they weren't dead. They were just cold. It's New York City, people. Well, I don't know if Garfield even lived in New York City. Ah! While Garfield had his car vandalized as well, he put those into his to paper, creating the novel, of course, called Death Wish. <laughs> The novel would change in the writing room. At first, Garfield had plenty of options. One of them was to write the script for Death Wish, but he would choose another book, or one of his own books to make into a movie. Moving on, the road to production of Death Wish would be a long one. At first, the screenplay had two endings, one with the visionary dying at the hands of the same mothers that terrorized his family, thus having Frank Ochoa, the detective, on the case of the murdering vigilante taken over for the vigilante in his own self-righteous ways. The second ending will be having the vigilante being escorted to the hospital, injured, by Ochoa with the vigilante's gun in hand. None of these endings will be used. For casting and directing, this will be the difficult part of the process. At first, United Artists wanted Jack Lemon as Paul Kersey, Sidney Lumont as director, and Henry Fonda as Detective Frank Ochoa. None of that happened. Henry Fonda declined the role, saying the script was repulsive. Actor George C. Scott was up for the role, but read the script, calling it violent, and turned it down. Where would United Artists go? As some of the leading men in Hollywood at the time were rejecting the role, what would be their next option? Meanwhile, in the search for the director, United Artists will hire British director Michael Winter, of course, the director who is familiar with gritty, violent films such as The Mechanic and Stone Killer. Michael Winter wanted American actor Charles Bronson, but could United Artists find his key to this project in the lead role? Not so fast! Bronson's agent read the script. He felt the film could carry a dangerous message, nor suited Bronson. The author, Garfield, felt the role didn't suit Bronson as well. Winner called Garfield an idiot. Shameful. Shameful. Bronson stated at the film's release that he felt he wasn't right for the movie. He felt the main character was made for more likely Dustin Hoffman, who can play a weaker kind of man. But 
before anything could happen, United Artists would drop the project due to budget constraints, and producers Landers and Roberts would liquidate their rights. The two producers would be eventually replaced by Italian film mogul Dino Di Lodotes, responsible for such films as 1976 King Kong, Hollywood 2, and Flash Gordon, as many other films. Anyways, De Laurentiis was able to secure funding for the film. Paramount will handle the release in the United States, while Columbia will handle the film's release internationally. Charles Bronson was signed on to play the main lead at the time. Bronson was more international, starring in more international films, more spaghetti westerns during the early 70s and late 60s. He came back to the States, instantly becoming a star. He was signed mainly because of his working relationship with director Winner, who directed him in previous films. By 1973, Bronson was on top of the world, a top box office attraction, commanding one million per film. Under Dino Arte's film company, the script will be revised again. Many producers and writers didn't like the death in the title, especially Dino Arantis himself. They felt it would scare people away. So most of the posters read, Sidewalk Vigilante. Winner thought the title was lame. De Laurentiis thought about it, realizing the world death could bring butts to seats. It soon changed. God, people are so edgy back then. But at least they didn't have the whole, well, let's say they tried to be wholesome back then compared to the virtual singing buffoons of the modern day. Now that De Laurentiis, Paul's last name would change to Kersey from Benjamin. He was no longer a accountant in the novel. He was, but a architect. Instead of being a World War II vet, he will become a Korean War vet. There was also a change in the final dynamics. There wasn't much any of the family in the novel, but the script made Kirsty interact with his wife just a little bit more. In the beginning, they was on trip in to Hawaii. The film will be filmed in Tucson, Arizona, Hawaii, and New York, much to the dismay of Bronson, who wanted to film the movie in LA to be closer to his children and family, but didn't get his way. But he later brushed it off. Filming took place over the winter of 1973 and 74. For the soundtrack, Grammy Award winning jazz musician Herbie Hancock reviewed the score due to the suggestion of Michael and his girlfriend. Hancock would give the film a rich jazzy theme for the score, and first Dylan Lortis wanted a cheap English band to do the score, according to Michael Wiener himself. The film was released on July 24th, 1974. The movie not only starred Charles Bronson, but Vincent Gordini as NYPD's detective, Brent Ochoa. He would have been charged with stopping cursing his visually into Grand Page. This movie will also introduce the Chaos Thieves, the Fly, and the Grandmaster himself, Jeff Goldblum, for the first time ever. He played one of the film's villains called Frequent. Yes, that was his role. It was rumored that Denzel Washington got his start in this movie, but that was proven to be false. The plot of Death Wish still carries the same as the novel. While Kersey's wife is murdered, his daughter is raped in a home invasion, led by Jeff Goldblum's character, sending Paul Kersey on the road to becoming a visual anti. The movie received mixed reviews, many not liking it because it promoted visual antism. God, people are very soft. Many critics called the movie immoral. A threat to society and encouragement of antisocial behavior. Oh, please give me a break. Really? Is that what we're going with these days? Well, seven is just the same. Garfield was not happy about this film. His book was pretty much against vigilantism. Not to make Paul Kersey a hero, a sickening man also, in fact. And also a romanticized the vigilante. You would not stand for the movie or any of the sequels. The writers in the novel, the comic books are really never happen when people go against what they wrote in their media, I should say. But hey, sometimes I don't blame them. There was a sequel to the book written by Garfield called Death Sentence. It wouldn't become a film until 30 years later with the leading role played by Kevin DeBacon. The movie had nothing to do with the book. Garfield had no comment. 
Nonetheless, the film didn't stop people from liking it or having a lasting legacy. The movie was successful at the box office. If Charles Brosnan wasn't an icon, it surely made him an American film icon now, only at the age of 52. Oh, the series was nowhere, but it'll take many years for the sequel to come out. Enter Canon Film. <laughs> Canon film owner Mannheim Golan and Johann Govis were properly obtained the rights from D.L. Rankin's production company after he threatened to sue them they didn't get their rights properly. For the sequel, Canon didn't use any of the ideas from Garfield's book and decided to go into a different direction. Bronson was offered $1.5 million to reprise his role. He would only take the role if his wife Jill Ironman was hired for the role. She would take the role as Paul Gersey's new girlfriend. Also, Vincent Lornia would turn to his role to test of old chore. Director Michael Winter would direct the film in his return to filming after years of spending, well, I wouldn't say pretty much not doing any directing, but without a box office hit. Another current movie star in this day and age will make his appearance in this film. Lawrence Fishburne will play Cutter, a gangbanger with a ghetto blaster. This time, Paul Kirsten is interested to go around killing random bad guys. He was targeting them for revenge. He didn't just use guns, but he used different weapons and different ways of killing. Originally, San Francisco was going to be the city used in the movie, but San Francisco was used for another gun totally anti-hero. They will use the city as Angeles the backdrop. Jimmy Page will compose the film soundtrack. He was also Michael Winner's neighbor at the time. This time around, Paul Kersey was living a happy life in LA with his new girlfriend, new job, and hoping his daughter would recover from her trauma from the previous film. All seemed well until his daughter faced brutality again, unleashing Paul's rage. Death Wish 2 was released February 19th with a budget of $8 million, but would make $60 million at the box office, perhaps a little bit more. Critics was not happy about this movie. They gave it a lower score. And this will continue to keep happening in each movie too. But... It wasn't made for him. Yes, Bree. It wasn't made for the critics. Made for people like me who enjoy zany stuff like this and action stuff. The movie received a Razzie Award for Worst Musical Score ever. The movie was mad, like I said, but I enjoyed every minute of it. But the man is just not stop us, Death Wish 2. Three years later, Death Wish 3 was released due to the success of the previous film, Cannon Figure. And the source of the company's source of success will come from action movie star Bronson and also the great Chuck Norris. Bronson wanted more money, so no Chuck Norris was asked to play the role, but rejected the role, saying the violence in the movie was too negative. Now, that's quite weird, all the violence in these movies. Really? Bronson was paid $1.5 million out of the $10 million budget, thus returning to make Death Wish 3. This time, Percy will return to New York. Screenwriter Don Jacoby drew inspiration for this film from science fiction films and other films like the Rambo series. Much to the dismay of Bronson, who didn't want a Rambo type figure. There will be other scripts written, but all were rejected for Jacoby's script. Again, like a winner directed the film with a camera. Then back in. Filming took place in Brooklyn for the grittiness, but the filming location was changed across the pond in London. This time, Paul Percy would find himself in a war with a bunch of street punks. He was armed to the T. The critics hated this movie more than the previous films, but this was not stop Cannon films from making more, even though they were starting to go into the negative. The critics weren't moved by Bronson's performance or his motivation in the film. But do I care? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. No. The movie was also made into a video game of the same name for the Commodore 64 system. Pretty much the game copies the movie All Out War. Then it was Death Wish 4, The Crackdown. But this time, Winner wasn't a director. 
He was occupied with another film. And Phil Bronson was displeased with the previous film. The director, J. Lee Thompson, stepped in. Another collaborator with Bronson performed the fourth film. We switch our focus back to L.A. once again. In the original, he was to reconnect with his old girlfriend, played by his wife. And was supposed to be struggling with his conscience, but those were rejected. For one, Jill Island was battling cancer at the time. The next script, Percy was supposed to go after a terrorist, but that script was rejected. In another script, he was originally supposed to have a surrogate son, but the drawing board felt the girl would hit him differently for Percy since um, he usually did have a daughter. Another star would star in this movie as well. Machete kills. Machete don't tweet. But this time, Percy goes out to the drug lords in the city after the death of his new girlfriend's daughter. Once again, Cannon films back this film. It was released in 1987, and once again, the plot is full of craziness and 80 action fun. But did they stop there? Well, um, Cannon films stopped there, just to say. Um, they was losing money by the millions, thus collapsing. It was 21st Century Film Company. No, not 20th Century Fox. It was 21st Century Film that was behind the fifth and final installment of this franchise. Death Wish 5, The Face of Death, was released in 1994. It will be the last movie in the franchise, like I said before, and it will be the last that Bronson would star in. He looked out of breath, tired, ready to call it quits. By this time, he was in his 70s. This time, Paul Kersey went against the mob boss. Paul Kersey tries to protect his new girlfriend from mob boss Tommy O'Shea, played by the late Michael Parks. The film was directed by Alan A. Goldstein. 20th Century Film wanted to release a sixth installment without the man who made the series, but 20th Century Film, not Fox, would kick the boot, joining Canon Films in the gutter of graves of... You get my meaning. Death Wish 5 will be Bronson's final time in a big time Hollywood production. He will finish his career with a TV movie trilogy called The Family of Cops that spanned from 96 to 1999 on CBS. In 2003, the great Charles Bronson will pass away at the age of 81. The Death Wish series is finally over. It will be forgotten, but there is always another. In 2006, it was pushed to bring the Death Wish series back. The man behind it was old Sly himself, but nothing happened. Years later, there was more rumors about a remake with old Sly as the lead role, but it would change to starting Liam Neeson or Frank Grillo, aka Crossbones, and then it was Benicio Del Toro, but nothing happened out of those three. But it took an old action star, an old cranky action star, to take the role. Bruce Willis would become the new Paul Kersey. Death Wish the remake will be released on March 2nd, 2008 under the MGM banner. The film will suffer many script rewrites and directors leaving the same way the original movie started. Unlike his predecessor, Paul Kersey is a doctor. The film takes place in Chicago. His family was more predominant. I think his daughter even survived. Well, this time, he also had a brother named Frank, played by Vincent D'Onofrio. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this movie was directed by Eli Roth. It was not favorable with the critics based on the dried up script and the timing of the movie's release. Time and shortly after the Parkland shootings. I actually seen this movie twice and I don't remember anything really except for this scene right here. So you're not gonna kill me? No. Jack is. Other than that, I would say the movie doesn't come close to the original. Bruce Willis is alright in this movie, but it's not good enough. Heck, I don't even really hate this movie. It was just ma to me. At least it wasn't offensive compared to another remake that was recently released. Ah! This film, like Black Christmas, was better off not being made. I think we've seen the end of the Death Wish franchise. Hopefully Black Christmas as well. I don't know, man. I will go into a rage bucket about that, but I'm not. In the end, the Death Wish franchise 
should have been one movie, but I won't complain too much. I enjoyed this series very much with all this corniness, with all this 80s glam, and all this 80s corniness and whatever else you want to call it. I'm grateful that Cannon Films helped shoot up all of these movies. They also gave way to other visual anti movies, as you can say. The Death Wish series will live on in parodies for years to come. It will always be part of Charles Bronson's legacy, and I would always put a smile on my face whenever I watch any of the five films. But Hollywood, if y'all listening, no more Death Wish movies. You're done. With that being said, enjoy this Simpson clip of Charles Bronson before heading out. The young Charles Bronson's brief stint replacing Andy Griffith in The Andy Griffith Show. Where's Otis? He's not in his cell. I shot him. Well, that's... What? Now I'm going down to Emmett's Fix-It Shop to fix Emmett.